Hello and welcome back to this damn bullet idealistic crusade. This video is a review of Kino Lorber's release of the first two of the three Paramount talkie early sound films based on the Sax Romer character of Fu Manchu. Uh, Fu Manchu is a character that of course has a lot, and when I say a lot I mean a lot of baggage that comes along because of the character in the novels and short stories particularly uh, and, and unfortunately being uh, a, a big cause of promoting and continuing the uh, unfortunate racism that existed at the time period, what is typically known as and referred to as the Yellow Peril. However, uh, Fu Manchu is a character and the world that Rumor created in the original uh, stories and in the novels was extraordinarily influential on both uh, adventure fiction and adventure films because Fu Manchu became adapted many, many different times in, in both radio and film and many other mediums. And this would go on and off, really, until uh, MGM made their film version in 1932, The Mask of Fu Manchu, which is probably the most famous uh, of the various film adaptations. It's one of the most gloriously pre-code of all pre-code Hollywood films, and it was made in MGM surprisingly so it's MGM kind of amping up the the lurid aspects and at some points it definitely feels like an adventure serial and you have Boris Karloff playing Fu Manchu with a delicious sort of extra accent of what has been termed or looked at as as a sort of camp humor however it is filled with a number of really cringe-inducing, terrible, awful speeches and things that go back to the unfortunate inherent racism involved with whenever you discuss this character. And on top of that, in all the adaptations, you're having a non-Chinese actor or a essentially a Caucasian actor playing this role in some form of makeup, and you also have other uh, side characters and the various henchmen and things, uh, and of course uh, Fu Manchu's daughter, Falo Si, almost always being played by a Caucasian actress in makeup. So you have the uh, not only the inherent racism involved with the character, literally from the original pages of the short stories and novels, but then you also have how that translates into the films and the, the practices at the time period. Uh, you're going to run into that with a lot of the casting. So it's, it's unfortunately something that means you, you do have to look at it with the context of when it was made and the inherent negatives that are involved with this character. I've wanted to read the novels for some time, but I've always kind of put it off because I knew just how bad some of the material was involved. Uh, I, I still am going to read them. I just I've, I've put it off for a really long time because I, I really don't enjoy ever coming across anything like that and I, I, I will read them because I know they are extremely important and were very influential on an entire generation actually several generations of both uh, American and British writers especially and a lot of adventure fiction uh, so I think that's really the most important thing to look at when you look at this character and the stories the novels and the various film adaptations is how influential these stories and the, these these characters are to things that came afterwards that drew directly from them. So these stories kind of created a number of archetypes, particularly for adventure stories. Uh, they also have a, a great deal of Conan Doyle influence because Romer was writing and you can very much see the... Uh, Nayland Smith is a sort of uh, disguised Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Petrie is his Dr. Watson and so Fu Manchu is very much a uh, Professor Moriarty type. That's some, a comparison pretty much I think everybody comes to so that's usually the first thing you, you, you notice. But uh, essentially I wanted to mention a little bit of this because this is a very difficult uh, subject to discuss and of course it's no secret that the mask of Fu Manchu itself was uh, the subject of outcries when uh, I guess MGM wanted to reissue it but it was in the 1970s and they actually went in and edited the negative so then they removed a lot of the unfortunately terrible speeches and things but then they also removed some other things and there were also uh, censor cuts made after the production code was put into effect because there's no way that film would have ever <laughs> made it past the production code. Uh, it's one of the most gleefully lurid of all pre-code films. Uh, but for many decades after that point in the early 1970s, uh, the film was only available in an edited version. And when they finally were able to put the pieces back in, uh, that's why it's so jarring when you see the film now. All of a sudden, the quality drops when you get to these pieces that uh, were removed from the original negative in the 1970s, you know, basically 40 years after the film came out. So the 
th this stuff is unfortunately inherent whenever you're dealing with the character. And fortunately, some of the adaptations actually manage to dial that factor down or sort of sidestep it in a number of ways. Which brings us to the Paramount films, which were the first uh, sound films based on the character. There had been a number of uh, adaptations before, particularly two British silent serials, uh, which survive uh, to this day in some forms, and you can actually go and look at them. But what's interesting about these is they were three films made at Paramount. The first is, of course, The Mysterious Dr. Fu Manchu in 1929. The second was literally a direct follow-up a year later, The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu. And then the third film, was entitled Daughter of the Dragon, which uh, had a different director and a slightly different approach because Fu Manchu himself only appears in the opening section and the torch essentially gets passed to his daughter, who in this film is played by Anna Mae Wong, and the sort of heroic slash love interest is played by Sessio Hayakawa. So what's great about the third film is you actually do have a lead actor and a lead actress in an early talkie in Hollywood actually getting to play their own ethnicities and and they're actually intelligent characters and not caricatures so it, it's an interesting film for those reasons and that's really the best element of it however when you do watch all three films i do think at least for me i think it's the weakest of the three in terms of its story but it's a shame they couldn't include it here uh, which apparently was because they couldn't uh, address some rights issues so this is again a release of only the first two films uh, but you can watch the third film there are a number of uploads on youtube that are actually not terrible in quality they're they're at least watchable uh, but it still remains to be seen if those rights issues can be worked out and the third film can get a release someday as well i know kino is also doing a separate anime wong collection which is great to see because her films have been extremely underrepresented on video as pretty much all these films i'm discussing uh, have been underrepresented on video in fact these three paramount fu manchu films have never been released on video ever before this point. So that's why this was so important, and uh, you couldn't even really see the first two. Uh, and then the versions floating around, finally, of them have been really terrible, so I've just kind of put it off. I also put it off because I was afraid, as what you see some of in uh, MGM's Mask of Fu Manchu, literally made just a little while later in 1932, uh, you would expect these Paramount films to be, you know, basically kind of going heavier on the unfortunate uh, inherent racism aspects of the character. Plus, you have the, the notion of you, you're again dealing with a non-Asian actor playing this role. However, this time, it's actually Warner Oland, who was, uh, at this point, like, like a lot of actors, being cast in other ethnic roles by Hollywood as a sort of general practice. Uh, but this was apparently the role that kind of got him cemented as, the, as, as a go-to actor for different ethnicities. He had done it before, but uh, with this, and then shortly thereafter, he, of course, in his most iconic role, began playing Charlie Chan for Fox in the long-running Charlie Chan series, which is is really the absolute antithesis of Fu Manchu as a character. And in fact, Charlie Chan was created specifically to be an anti-Fu Manchu, to have at least some kind of positive Asian character in Western pop culture. Of course, nothing is perfect, and you do have to even look at the Charlie Chan films and stories with their historical context, but those are remarkable for the time period in actually trying to do something that at least has some positive views of another culture, even though it that series quickly became a sort of stereotype in its own right. Uh, but here you have essentially Oland just before he would start playing Charlie Chan, playing Fu Manchu uh, particularly in these first two films, and he's in the beginning sort of, you know, he's in the sort of opening reel or 15, 20 minutes of the third film and then kind of just passes the torch. So you go in expecting something like MGM's Mask of Fu Manchu, and you expect you're going to have to wince quite a lot, and of course you're going to be having to deal with some of the unfortunate practices of the time period of casting uh, actors as characters of other ethnicities that are not their own. 
But what's really surprising about these films and why I think this release is so important, uh, and of course it is the first and only release of these films on video ever, essentially these films aren't quite doing the, the, the Fu Manchu you think of. They have slightly changed and reshaped things to actually make Fu Manchu a... I mean, he's really a, a, a character that can be related to. They give him a motivation for his crusade against the West and, and civilization at large, essentially. And they do this with an interesting sort of framing device where you actually see a skirmish during the Boxer War and uh, Oland as Fu Manchu has, has a family in this house and he is cooperating with everyone and is a very peaceful man. But of course, things go terribly wrong and some British soldiers actually wind up opening fire on uh, on their targets who have basically gone around the the estate and in the process uh, Fu Manchu's house gets shot at and bombed and in the process it winds up killing his wife and child which pushes him over the edge and basically transforms a man of peace into a, a man after vengeance and that's the approach this the, these these three films take which is an absolute departure from how Fu Manchu is in the short stories and novels and the other adaptations so here it's actually based in something that's understandable and the rest of the film literally we have a sort of flash forward to you know, some years later and we find that all the various members of that group of soldiers has been dying under mysterious circumstances. And now we're in London, and Fu Manchu has arrived in London to essentially finish what he began, which was to systematically eliminate all those he held responsible for the death of his wife and child. And essentially what they've done is... I mean, the closest thing, what immediately pops to mind is this very much has the flavor of they have recast Fu Manchu in more of the guise of what we would think of as a Dr. Fibes revenge story or even the reinvention of Mr. Freeze in Batman the Animated Series, having the sort of tragic backstory that has made him cold and remote and driven only by revenge and vengeance. And that's sort of blotted out everything else and become his whole existence. That's the type of characterization you're getting here. And in this, what Olin does with the role is to, as always, be the smartest man in the room and be many steps ahead of everyone else. You get the sense that they're trying to make Fu Manchu a more... I guess, I guess the easiest way to put it is more of a digestible character. It gives the audience actually someone to root for in a sense, and it actually manages to do a nice job of downplaying a lot of the unfortunate uh, negative aspects that always are, are the, the, the sort of baggage that comes with anything having to do with this character and the unfortunate uh, inherent racism of the original conception of the character in the short stories. So this is a very surprising experience. You go in, again, thinking something like, uh, you're going to see something like what you saw in Mask of Fu Manchu. This is at Paramount, of course, so it does have a, a, a sense of the Paramount, more European style, but it's also an early talkie. We're talking about 1929 for the first film. And so while you are going to run into moments that do feel a bit stagey and there's not as, as much camera movement, obviously, and, and not as much cutting as you would expect a couple of years down the road it's it's quite surprisingly more advanced than most early talkies would be uh, both of the first two films were directed by Roland V. Lee who would go on to make uh, was probably his most famous film uh, he directed Son of Frankenstein at, at the end of the 30s in 1939 when he was working at Universal so uh, he, had, he had already directed a good number of films by this point but having Lee as director I, I think really helped to elevates this this first film in particular over uh, how stagey it could have been for a 1929 early talkie. Uh, unfortunately, you do still see some staginess on a lot of the other performances, but Oland is the highlight, and it's fascinating if you know how, how he played Charlie Chan just shortly thereafter for many years. You can almost start to see some sort of 
very minute uh, reflections of of his Charlie Chan that would come later, but just in the completely mad and and revenge obsessed uh, version of Fu Manchu we have here. And the most fascinating aspect, at least for me, and again tying back to sort of imagining this character in more of a Doctor Fives type scenario, uh, this Fu Manchu has a particular thing he likes to do <laughs> when when he has uh, moved one step closer and eliminated another of his enemies in a particularly inventive way. And that, again, gives you that wonderful Dr. Fibes flavor. Uh, but what he has done is kept the tapestry of this big, essentially golden dragon that was hanging in the room where his family was killed. And when they died, it collapsed on them and was covered and stained in their blood. So you have this really visual representation of, of why Fu Manchu is doing this in these films. And every time he manages to eliminate one of the soldiers all this time later, he has gone in and repainted a single scale to be gold again. He's painted over the blood. And so when he has completed his mission of revenge, essentially, he will once again have the perfect tapestry with all the blood painted out. It's a wonderful visual. It's a great idea, and it's it's a highlight of these films that you have that visual manifestation of, of why this character is doing this. And again, it gives you a reason to associate with this character. They have humanized him in this extent to give a reason for why he is doing all these terrible things and essentially just going around and killing people. So in addition to Oland actually making a very effective uh, Fu Manchu here in spite of the casting issue and accentuated by how they have reformulated the character to be more sympathetic... Uh, and thankfully dialed out uh, quite a bit of the unfortunate inherent racism of the character. The other great benefit of this film is the fact it was made at Paramount. So even though the sets aren't extraordinarily extensive all the time, they are done in, in a really interesting way to always suggest the setting. So whether it's the opening in China or it's in the Limehouse District of London on the waterfront, uh, the film does a really wonderful job at conveying the sense of location. You get the sense of atmosphere in all the sets and even in some of the uh, backlot sets that were used for exteriors. It's really well done, and this helps to enhance the film overall and make it feel less like a very stagey early talkie. And especially when they're going around London, you could compare it to, of course, what everybody likes to think of for an early talkie in London is the London scenes of Dracula two years later in 1931. And you can compare the two and see the difference between a universal early talkie set in London and the much more atmospheric Paramount early talkie set in London. Another thing this film also kind of did, and of course the other two films that followed, this is apparently where the notion of the Fu Manchu mustache that everybody thinks of uh, uh, the character having, this is really apparently where that sort of design kind of first appeared. So apparently it was actually something that Paramount's makeup department came up with. The other factor that's a real draw, particularly for classic Hollywood fans, is you do have a number of very familiar faces in the other lead roles. Uh, now, the, the Fu Manchu's arch nemesis, uh, Sir Nayland Smith of Scotland Yard, who is the other main protagonist of all of these stories and is essentially very much patterned on Sherlock Holmes, is played by O.P. Heggie, who is probably most famous to us for playing the blind hermit in Bride of Frankenstein. So it's fascinating seeing him in a more action-oriented uh, inspector type of role. The other more well, technically more the juvenile lead is played by Neil Hamilton, who was a very experienced actor by this point. And of course, we see him for one second and immediately think of his iconic Commissioner Gordon from the Batman 66 series. So he appears here in the Fu Manchu films uh, about the same time or just before he would appear in the first couple of MGM Tarzan films. So he pops up all over the place, and especially in films with more of an action adventure bent. But uh, even more fascinating than that uh, is that this film and the sequel is actually a very early role for Jean Arthur. She plays the uh, essentially the the heroine of these stories who's always the, the damsel in distress in ways uh, in the various plots that happen in both films. But it's fascinating seeing her in this type of film, which is 
completely atypical of, of her famous work, uh, start, primarily kicking off when uh, Frank Capper cast her in Mr. Deeds Goes to Town in 1936. That really, you know, jump-started her career and made her a star overnight. Uh, but she had been working for, for years and years and years, but you don't really think of her in a film like this and being put in the various death traps and also being extremely young and not really having her sort of star persona fully developed it, it's it's there in bits and again because this is an early talkie you can see some of the actors they're having to 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 fight the urge to be more stagey because it's it's obviously going to feel much more like a stage play orientation and again the camera's not moving around very much and they're having to work around the confines of it being an early talkie so it's i think most fascinating in terms of the the famous faces because you have Jean Arthur, before she has her full star persona really nailed down, you see flashes of it, but it's just so weird seeing her in a film like this, and she does re reappear with the other leads for the film's sequel. So the first two films are really joined at the hip. They're very much, and they were made back to back because the first film was successful, and the second film is basically more of the same. Uh, and then the third film does transition a little bit because it is basically about the daughter of Fu Manchu and you essentially have the first couple minutes kind of linking back to the first two films but then they also make some changes in the cast and crew so it does feel a bit different and not everyone uh, appears in the third film so these films are actually quite an interesting surprise they're not quite what you expect and they're not quite what you think they're going to be going in and especially if you're like me and your only real experience with this character is MGM's Mask of Fu Manchu made just a little later in 1932 uh, these these are a really different animal and and so they're actually not the sort of cringe-inducing thing you're, you're going to expect whenever you, you think of an adaptation of Fu Manchu. And I really appreciate that there's something different, and that makes them, particularly the first film, feel more interesting. And I think Roland V. Lee does try to pick up certain scenes and certain sequences and, and try to invest some energy in there so they don't feel so stodgy. I, I think you really get this in the first film, particularly in the opening uh, sort of bookend sequence that takes place in China that sets up the story with, again, the soldiers and the killing of Fu Manchu's family and, and seeing his character disintegrate in that one moment. It is a really striking opening, and uh, that whole sequence, particularly with all the sound effects and the gunfire and the cannons and things, it is remarkable for a 1929 film being this early in the sound era it is a, a real surprise so I, I think this is a film that kind of hits far above the level you expect it to and so it wins you over i think again not being able to ever you know fully escape the inherent uh negative aspects of the character it does at least try to address some of those and it does essentially rework the character into more of a sympathetic villain. Uh, however, when you get to the second film, uh, you know, I, as I said, the first film really does kind of win you over. And the second film, The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu in 1930, is pretty much more of the same. It does have some interesting set pieces and some interesting gimmicks, but unfortunately it it doesn't seem to have the same amount of energy throughout. It's still well put together like the first film. It just feels as if it doesn't have the same amount of inspiration throughout. Essentially, it's it's like it runs out of gas a little bit towards the end. And it does wind up feeling like more of the same film you just saw. It just doesn't seem to add up as much as the first film. So it's nice to have them together because if you watch the first film, you will want to see the second film. Some people do prefer the second film and as with the first film all the best scenes are the scenes where Oland is actually on screen as Fu Manchu because he has the most energy he has the most screen presence and of course every time he's on screen the plot is being driven forward so uh, it, you can also see the classic archetypes of the hero and villain having the one-on-one -on -one conversation where every line or word of dialogue is full of malicious intent so you get those those fun double entendre in terms of the classical hero villain setup and there are some more interesting death traps and narrow escapes and things like you get in the first film but again this just feels more of like an addition 
to the first film. But it is very much unified because you have the same cast and crew returning, so you get that nice sense of continuity. And we even get the tapestry returning in the second film. So basically, the second film picks up right where the first film left off and just continues it. Um, so it's it's still well put together, particularly for, we're talking about 1930 now, so it's still in early talking. You still get some of that sense of that having more atmosphere because it's a Paramount film versus, a, versus another studio producer. Uh, producing it uh, but it is pretty much just a we rushed into this relatively quickly because the first film wound up being rather successful and then after return of dr fu manchu which sort of goes into a a very rushed ending at the climax because they get to the end sort of set up and then that's just it uh, then short time later paramount decides they're going to do a third film and they sort of work the opening to then connect to the second film and have Oland as Fu Manchu again sort of pass the torch to his daughter played by Anna Mae Wong. Uh, I just personally feel when you watch all three of these films and again you will have to track down Daughter of the Dragon in some fashion or watch it in one of the many uploads you find floating around even here on YouTube. Uh, I just don't think it's as well written. I really love the fact that in spite of it still being a, a Fu Manchu type story, uh, that you do have two actors in the lead roles at least getting something to do and not play caricatures and that you don't have your two lead characters being played by uh, performers of other ethnicities, uh, usually under some form of makeup. So that is refreshing and that is the best element of that film. But I think it's a weaker film overall in terms of its story and its plotting than the first two films. And what you're going to run into as well with all three of these, like a lot of different things, every time you have the master villain who gets thwarted, it's always like, well, d does he really have a plan B? Is there, is there, is there any other goal besides this? Or, you know, it, shouldn't he regroup and maybe come at this from a different angle and not be so obvious? So you can poke holes in the stories. And again, you do have to keep in mind, these are films from the early talkie days and they are deviating rather heavily from their source material they basically just took some of the names and kind of ran with it and did their own thing but i do really think these are more effective and thankfully less cringe inducing than than what you would expect and i think part of the reason why that you might have that sort of knee-jerk reaction against these films thinking that they're not going to be any good and have that cringe-inducing factor is they just simply haven't been available and people haven't seen them uh, outside of maybe a rare uh, showing at a film festival or a rare mention in a book. I didn't even really know of their existence until a couple of years ago when I was researching and reading up more on Warner Olin because I'd seen him in some films and really liked his performances and, and knew he had played Charlie Chan most famously, but I had no idea he had been in Fu Manchu films and that they had been made by Paramount and they deviated this much from the sort of stereotypical image. And uh, seeing these now, that they had, at least the writers at Paramount, had tried to make Fu Manchu a sympathetic character and tried to at least in some ways sidestep or dial down some of the unfortunate yellow peril nonsense and terrible stuff that is unfortunately inherent in this character. So while they do have some unfortunate negatives that were part of the unfortunate and unfortunately part of history at that time and unfortunately reflect viewpoints people had at the time these films are actually much better than what you would expect them to be and particularly the first two i think have you know a tight enough story and they do have short run times so they don't overstay their welcome in fact some might be a little too short uh they're, they they essentially they, they they punch above their their level they they are quite effective and i think the first film is the strongest overall and really surprisingly well made for an early talkie and really tries to do some things that are actually quite effective in terms of some of the camera staging some of the sound effects some of the editing and it's not as stodgy and stagey as an early talkie could be at that time it does have some of that inherent but it actually manages to overcome some of that so i think these are really surprising films that if any of this sounds interesting you might want to look into because they are not doing what mgm would do shortly thereafter in mask of fu manchu uh, and they don't have 
the crazy, terrible monologues and yellow peril nonsense that does get spouted at points in Mask of Fu Manchu. It has some fragments of that, unfortunately, still. And, of course, the un unfortunate practice of what is termed yellow face in terms of casting Caucasian actors in Asian roles. But outside of those factors, these are, you know, again, they are quite surprising. They're not quite what you think they're going to be. So that's why I'm very pleased that they do, at least the first two films, do now have a Blu-ray release from Kino Lorber, because, again, these films have never been released on video ever in the past. And I, I think they should be seen and discussed because they are quite interesting and quite fascinating, particularly for their time period, and in trying to humanize this character in some ways. And also, you know, they're, they're quite well made for early talkies, which is very surprising. And then on top of that, you get to see some famous faces when they were very young, and it feels very strange. Um, so to talk about this release further from Kino Lorber, this is again a Blu-ray release of the first two films, Mysterious Dr. Fu Manchu and Return of Fu Manchu, both early talkies from 1929 and 1930. Uh, again, they couldn't release the third film as well because they couldn't work out the rights exactly. So that film is still uh, not available on a disc release anywhere. They were originally Paramount films. They are now handled by Universal, who has most of the Paramount library at that from that time period. They are credited as new 2K masters. So to talk about the picture quality of these. Now, these are early talkies. They have not been you know, kept in pristine shape. They were probably reissued at that time period many times, and the elements are obviously not pristine. So when you go into this and you see new 2K Master and you know Universal handled it, it could be a master from any time in the past, you know, five to seven years maybe, and it's going to only probably be of so-so quality, more like of 2K preservation. That's really what you're going to see here because... The elements are what they are, and they have not been meticulously restored. So you are going to see in both films a variety of things. You're going to see inherent damage. You're going to see some scratches. You're going to see some speckling. You're going to see some definite frame wobble. You're going to see a few hairs here and there. You're going to see even a, a terror or two. Uh, there is there is some sort of uh, image movement and some sort of pulsing here and there. There are some issues where the, the film does have, uh, seem to almost go out of focus for a few frames here and there, and there are some missing frames. Now, that all being said, these do look far better than I actually expected them to look, because this is kind of what I went into it knowing it was going to be like. This is more of a 2K preservation scan. Uh, like some of the lesser known universal horror titles that Kino has put out from a quote new 2K master. As soon as you start either of these, you're, you're going to kind of know what you're in for, that these are more preservation element scans. So they're never going to be pristine. And these are also probably films that no one is ever going to do a 4K restoration of and go in frame by frame to do cleanup and things. And also so I'm pretty sure the elements that they have are extraordinarily limited. So even if they wanted to do that, it would be a very difficult and time-consuming process. So do expect things like scratches, tears, speckling, all kinds of issues to pop up. There are, again, missing frames. And there are, unfortunately, a couple of audio dropouts scattered throughout. Um, mostly they don't affect dialogue, but one or two do sort of clip a line a little bit. Uh, and, of course, these being early talkies to talk about the sound quality, uh, the sound itself is very limited due simply to the time at which these were made, being early talkies with the recording techniques of the time. And we're talking about 1929 and 1930, so they are very much early talkies. Uh, the sound is the original mono presented as DTS HDMA lossless, and it does seem like they have attempted some cleanup. I would guess this is Universal doing it. Uh, so you are still going to get plenty of natural hiss. There is a definite noise floor there. Uh, there is bits of crackle and distortion and things. Again, there are missing frames and also uh, little jumps and dropouts. So you are going to run into a number of those. This is never going to be a pristine track, but it also doesn't sound like it's been over manipulated to death either. So it, they have at least gone in and tried to do some cleanup work in terms of the presentation. So you're not getting any crazy amounts of, uh, say, ground hum or uh, distortion throughout or crackle throughout over everything so it has been worked on somewhat simply because it this is 
essentially trying to be more like a preservation element in this 2K Master, and now Kino has released both of them as a double feature. So for both the picture and sound, it they, they pretty much are what they are. And again, once you start watching both of these, I, th I think that becomes very obvious from the opening credits what, what sort of damage you're going to have to expect going through. However, I do think both films clean up rather well, so don't let that throw you at the beginning. They do still make overall rather fine presentations and obviously are far better than probably what these films existed in before this point. And, and these have never had a video release before. So, I mean, we're, we're pretty much kind of lucky we can even look at these in a presentable form. So uh, this is obviously never going to be pristine, but they, they clean up rather well. So I was rather, uh, rather pleased that the picture and audio quality was as good as it is on these. Now to talk about the packaging, Kino has surprisingly given this a slip cover with the image of Olin from the original film's poster and then you know promoted this as a double feature. So it's like most Kino slip covers with their type of design on the back. I was surprised that they gave this a slip cover because I figured this would just be another of the many sort of catalog releases they do that sort of just they do so many and people just don't even notice them and these films are quite obscure. Um, but of course once they sell out of the slip cover you'll just have the standard keep case which has the same art again promoting this as a double feature. And then the information for both films is here on the back with the run times as all Kino releases do. Then the interior is just the standard Kino label. And then to talk about the extras, because this actually does have substantial extras in the form of two brand new commentaries by the great Tim Lucas, who talks about the background of the character, the historical context of the character in the films. He discusses Sax Romer's work, Romer's writing, so he discusses the Fu Manchu of the stories and the novels. He discusses the inherent racism of the character, the history of the unfortunate Yellow Peril. Um, so he does try to dig deeper uh, and uh, examine and explain a lot more of the historical background of everything having to do with the character and these films, and then also talk about the production of these two films and how they sort of interrelate with each other. So uh, the commentaries are best heard, listened back to back, along with seeing the films back to back, because basically his second commentary very much builds on what he does in the first commentary. So this is a fantastic reason to pick up this release as well, because if you're like me and you only have a sort of general idea of this character and you're coming to these films for the first time, the the uh, commentaries by Lucas are absolutely must-listens and will definitely help explain uh, further what these two films do to differentiate themselves and to try to humanize the character and also dial down some of the very unfortunate aspects of the character that come from the original stories and novels. But he also explains and discusses the uh, Romer stories as being also a bit more nuanced in some ways and being very important uh, for influencing a number of generations in adventure writing, essentially, and that they should be read. So essentially, seeing these films and then listening to the commentaries and hearing you know, him discussing the actual printed works, the original stories, uh, kind of made me finally go, okay, well, yeah, I guess I do need to finally read these, even though you do have to essentially live with the unfortunate negative aspects, uh, and you have to try and just ignore them <laughs> look past them as you're reading and and trying not to to, to cringe terribly but uh, lucas does essentially go into the fact that there is more to the the, the stories than the uh, unfortunate negative aspects so that was that was nice to hear so nice to hear that essentially i i do need to finally go and read those and that you you can get something out of them thankfully other than the unfortunate negative aspects so the commentaries make this an even more important release and uh, you not only have two great commentaries for two films in one set, so you're getting a lot of content for your money, but these films have never had a video release ever in home video history before this point. So that makes it even more important that, that you can get this release for quite a cheap price, and it's all, you know, it's two films in one, uh, one package and two commentaries in one package. But that's not all, because we also get surviving trailers for these films, which are fascinating to see. They're obviously not in the best quality, but it's fascinating 
thing to have any trailer from this era survive, particularly for early talkies of and very obscure films. So that was a really wonderful touch, and uh, I was surprised that there was any sort of uh, trailer or any trailer material surviving for these. So that was a fascinating little inclusion, and I'm happy they did include them. So even though you just see commentary and trailer and you think, oh, well, the, you know, a lot of Kino discs have those. It's not it's not worth my money because there's not a ton of extras. Don't let that fool you. If you see Tim Lucas's name on something, you know it's a well-researched commentary worth its weight in gold and very worth your time. And you're getting two of those along with two very obscure rare films and surviving trailers. So this is a rather impressive release from Kino that kind of flies under the radar and you're getting a lot of value for your money in the two films and two commentaries plus one of their slipcovers if you're a slipcover fan. So those are my overall thoughts on the Kino Lorber release, their double feature Blu-ray release of the first two of Paramount's early talkie Fu Manchu films, The Mysterious Dr. Fu Manchu and The Return of Dr. Fu Manchu. Now these are obviously films that are not for everyone and... Not everyone is going to want to see films like this or anything having to do with the Fu Manchu character, which is understandable. However, I do think that even films and elements like these should be studied and looked at for their influence on, obviously, pop culture at large. But occasionally you get surprised uh, with films like these when you've just never had the chance to see them because, again, they've never been available on video before. And they go against your expectations quite greatly. So if you've seen MGM's Mask of Fu Manchu, these are not the same type of picture. They have significant differences. And quite interestingly, they're actually much more palatable than you would think and are actually more palatable than MGM's Mask of Fu Manchu uh, in terms of the, the negative elements and giving the, the character some sort of motivation for, for his quest of revenge and you know, the world domination part is kind of dialed down in these. So it's it's not the, the, the typical sort of, of Fu Manchu you think of and what you see in pretty much every other adaptation or version. So I think these are really fascinating films that I think people will be very surprised by uh, because most people have never seen these before. I had never gotten to see these before because they just simply have not been available. And so you just see them referenced occasionally and you're, you, you form a sort of mental picture about what they obviously must be like uh, so the, these are these are a really interesting surprise and I do want to commend Kino Lorber for actually releasing these and commissioning two commentaries and also for making them a single affordable release they are shorter films so they can fit quite nicely on the same blu-ray disc without any compression issues so I think that was also because they, they knew these would be a sort of harder sell and they probably wouldn't sell as much sold separately. Uh, so I think putting them together is a really great idea. It's just a shame that they obviously couldn't include the third film, which again was due to some rights issues. So this is just the first two of three films, but these two are so closely linked because they were made together that you can understand them being viewed together and then you can come to the third film a little later. Um, it helps to see them all together, but you can definitely definitely tell there's a sort of there, there, there's a sort of distance between the first two films and the third film because there were some lineup changes and it does feel a little bit different. So again, these are just my own thoughts. Your thoughts may vary. And this is a, a rather difficult and, and touchy subject, which is understandable. So whenever you look at this character or the various Fu Manchu adaptations, one must always be very cognizant of how other people may, may view these and why some people will most likely not want to view films or stories or read the the Fu Manchu novels and things. So that is very understandable. And it's also why these don't often get discussed. And then when they do, uh, it's always focusing on the inherent negative aspects of the character, which again is understandable. So one must always be fully aware of how, you know, everyone is going to view this material and the objectionable inherent aspects of it. But again, these, these, these Paramount films are very fascinating in that they do try to do something a bit different, and they're not the, the sort of 
terrible immediate negative cliches that you think of when you when you think of this character so that's that's why i found them really fascinating and again it made them easier to sit through because you were it, it wasn't you know constant cringing and things like you would expect so I, I think these are fascinating films to look at but you do have to go in understanding the and 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 acknowledging the the historical context of when they were made so that that is why i i want to make sure and stress that as a sort of disclaimer whenever i talk about any of the fu manchu film adaptations and I had been meaning to look at Indicator's release of the 1960s films, and then uh, Kino Lorber put out this release. So they they, they kind of just uh, I decided to look at one, so then I decided to look at the other. And of course, I've seen Mask of Fu Manchu a good number of times. So I just sort of got on this sort of thread of, of thought and went from one to the other because I was interested to see how they compared as well because they are all rather rather different from one another and thankfully these Paramount films and the 1960s films and also the Republic serial drums of Fu Manchu do manage to avoid some of the pitfalls that MGM fell into with Mask of Fu Manchu so thankfully they are at least in some ways more palatable and less immediately offensive uh, but of course those elements are still going to be there no matter what which is why I think it's important to sort of put that disclaimer in discussing any of these materials but I, I do think they are all uh, worth looking into and studying and also studying the effect of this character and Sax Romer's writing on pop culture as a whole. So that's why I wanted to make sure and at least talk about this with some degree of of being aware of that. And that's what I think anybody should do. Uh, and again, these, these are not going to be stories for everyone, and some people will want to avoid them, which is totally understandable. But I do think these Paramount films are, are, are very interesting, and especially for their time period. Uh, I, I think this is a really interesting and commendable Blu-ray release from Kino Lorber. And I'm very happy that they did it because they, these films have never had a release before. And so we finally can now view them and view uh, really wonderful extras talking about them in detail and going into uh, their place in history and how they uh, made some interesting changes to the overall character and background to to try to essentially play around with them and make them more uh, palatable for an audience at that time in 1929 and 1930. So uh, this is, I think, one of Kino's most important releases of the past year, and I, I think having two films in one with two commentaries really helped to sweeten the deal and make it uh, a, a really uh, important disc for people to look at uh, because you're also not only getting a lot of content for your money in a single release with a standard price point, uh, but they're also, it's also the only release these films have ever had, so that makes it even more important. So I do want to encourage people to check out this release if you're interested in any of this material or uh, if anything I've discussed uh, may have uh, you know, whetted your appetite to look at these films because they've just simply not been around and they're not quite what you expect them to be. So uh, I just thought they were extraordinarily interesting and far better than what I went in expecting because I kind of went in expecting <laughs> something more along the lines of a very stagey, uh, early talky with a lot of the cringe inducing elements that you see and mask of Fu Manchu. So uh, that's why I, I thought it was important to do a disc review and uh, talk about these films because most people probably aren't even aware of their existence or that Kino has even put them out because it sort of gets swallowed up in their massive amounts of releases and catalog titles. So as always, if you have any comments, I would love to continue the discussion in the comments section below. If you've seen these films, I would love to hear your opinions on them because I did find them very much better than what I expected them to be going in. I do hope my babblings about classic films and physical media releases has been at least somewhat informative and as always please do keep supporting both studio and boutique labels by buying films on disc to help keep both physical media and film culture alive and thank you ever so much for watching.